Today's GeoHug session is proudly supported by DataRog. Hey Cam, are you looking to get more value out of your mining data? No, Jess, I came here to data rock. No, Cam, data rock helps transform your raw data into clear and actionable insights. Oh, well, I mean, to be honest, Jess, that does kind of rock. And their user-friendly online platform and expert consulting team help geologists, engineers, and exploration professionals improve their all-body knowledge. Man, I completely misread the brief, Jess. Now uh, it makes perfect sense why you're wearing clothing that matches the background. I didn't realise that with Data Rock, you can visualise, analyse and interpret complex data to make smarter decisions, unlock hidden opportunities and increase efficiency. So let's take our mining operations to the next level with Data Rock and transform our data into actionable insights. Visit datarock.com today to register for a free demo. Let's Data Rock! And yes, it is so awesome to have Jarrett Olivier joining us today. So Jarrett is the Director of Planetary Geophysics at Fleet Space Technologies and the holder of numerous awards for his work in passive seismic methods. So during his career, he's developed novel low impact subsurface monitoring and imaging methods for the mining industry. And he is committed to expanding its use for mineral exploration. And it is going to be awesome getting the lowdown from him about ambient noise tomography. So it's going to be a great session. Please use the chat. We'll open up the floor at the end. And yes, thanks so much, Jarrett, for joining. It's amazing having you. Thanks, Jessica. And thanks, everyone, for attending. So I'm going to be talking today about ambient noise tomography for mineral exploration in particular. And I'm going to try and make it as easy to understand and as simple as possible for people who might have heard about the method, but they're not sure how it works or, or, or have not heard about the method at all. I'm gonna just start by kind of introducing a problem that I think we've seen for almost, well, probably for 80% of the geo hugs over the last year about the, the challenge we're facing at the moment in the mineral exploration industry, where we want to supply raw minerals for the energy transition but we're not finding these new deposits fast enough. And one of the reasons for that is that we've depleted or we found a lot of the shallow and easy to find ones, and we're having to explore deeper and deeper to find new deposits. This image on the right here shows um, some work from Richard Chodder showing like the, the depth to mineralization of recent discoveries. And you can see a clear trend where for, for copper in this case, where we're looking deeper and deeper to make new discoveries. And one of, the, one of the other challenges we face is, face is the way we've been exploring in the past, especially with using things like geochemistry or potential field geophysics, is not very well suited for imaging at depth or for exploring at depth. And that's because the, these potential field methods have relatively poor sensitivity at depth, but there's also a lot of non-uniqueness in what we're measuring. So we could be measuring variations in, in failure topography, as opposed to actually seeing denser bodies, or we could be measuring small bodies near surface as opposed to deep, deeper ones. So as many of you would know, seismic methods are some of the only geophysical methods that can image at depth. There are other exceptions, of course, like magnetotellurics or electromagnetic surveys, but seismic methods are one of the very underutilized methods thus far in mineral exploration. So today I'm gonna to unpeel some of these existing seismic methods that you've heard about before. And I'm going to introduce this new method called ambient seismic noise tomography. I'm going to give a little bit of a history on where it comes from and show some applications. Then I'm going to show some use cases for it in mineral exploration. And then finally, I'm going to show a live demonstration where we're actually conducting a survey as we speak. Um, and we've got instruments out in the field. So I'll, I'll log in there and show you what it looks like in real time. To start off with, I'm going to talk a little bit about the seismic methods that you've heard about in the past. So you would have broadly heard about either active or passive seismic methods. And active seismic methods, as the name suggests, re refers to when you are controlling the source of seismic energy. For near surface studies, you would have, would have seen people walking around with a sledgehammer. And for deeper studies, like for mineral exploration, we would use vibrating trucks or explosives to generate enough energy to image at depth. We used the reflected and refracted and diffracted body waves or, or waves that travel through the earth then to, tr to try and uncover what's below. On the other hand, we have passive seismic methods and that re relies on the natural vibrations that are occurring on earth. 
So at low frequencies, this typically is generated by the ocean interacting with the coast and from wind, the wind interacting with the lakes. And at higher frequencies, it's generated by human activity. And within these two categories, you've probably heard of two methods. The first is HVSR. So this is a, a quite a low cost method, but it's relatively low resolution and depth penetration. And it's been used quite effectively in Western Australia, for instance, to get the depth, the depth of shallow cover or the depth of the regolith and get some ideas of paleo channels and things like that. On the other end of the scale, you've also heard about active seismic imaging um, and Heather Shines did a really nice geoaccession session last year, I believe, about effective mineral exploration using seismic methods. So go check that out if you haven't seen it. And a company like HiSize also has some nice examples on their website. So check these out. So active seismic obviously has been used a lot in the oil and gas industry. There's been some nice use cases in the mining industry, but there are limitations or, or difficulties. First is, of course, the cost. So the cost per square kilometer or per cubic kilometer can be quite expensive. And it's very difficult to deploy in remote or environmentally sensitive areas. So if we think then about this, the seismic methods that we've heard about, if we think about it in terms of the cost versus capability, we've got HVSR, which is a relatively low cost and low capability method. And on the other end of the scale, we've got active seismic, which is very capable uh, in a lot of ways, but it is extremely expensive. In academia, there are quite a few methods that span that, that bridge these two. So there are, um, you can use local earthquake tomography, receiver functions, ambient noise tomography, refraction and diffraction studies, MASW and cross hole tomography. But by far the most popular method nowadays is this method called ambient noise tomography. So the method, uh, if you open any academic journal, you'll see a lot of examples of ambient noise tomography. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, where the method comes from and where it's been applied and why it works. So the method, even though I refer to it as an, quite a new method, it's the, the genesis of the method started in the 1950s. Um, and, Kate, and it started by Katie Arkey, one of the probably the most famous seismologists um, that ever lived, showed that the, the scattered waves that we, we normally would think of as noise contains information about the subsurface. Uh, John Clebo, a decade later, said something very similar. He said that you can retrieve the reflection response from, from a receiver by doing autocorrelations. And that actually has a link to Einstein's fluctuation dissipation theorem, theorem, theorem and um, Brownian motion for those interested. Then with, there, were, there were some laboratory measurements that show that in practice, you can actually do this. If you have two receivers and if you record noise, then you can retrieve the same signal that, as if you replaced one with the source. And in 2004, Nicolas Shapiro and Michelle Campieu showed that you can use the noise from the ocean in California to generate um, greens functions or these virtual active source signals. So in 2005, the first App tomography application was shown, and again, it was in California, and this is what this small image shows. And since 2005, there's been thousands of applications that have shown that the method can work on this crustal and regional scale using ocean waves. In 2015, I was involved in a study that showed that you can use um, sensors underground in active operating mines to, to image an oil body and to extract body waves. And then last year, Fleet conducted the first real-time ambient noise tomography exploration study. So we developed a device that can listen to these waves in real time and generate 3D images. So, so the method basically works, like I said, by exploiting these um, background vibrations, um, which are from low frequencies from natural sources and from high frequency at high frequencies from human activity. And this has led to what some have called a boom in boomless seismology. So this is an article written in 2014 describing this imminent boom of boomless seismology. And we did indeed see a large uptick in ambient noise tomography studies over the last decade. If you look at the, some of the trends in books and academic literature, you would have seen, um, and this is, a, this is a tool called Google Books Ingram Viewer that shows how common phrases are used in, in academic literature and in books. And if you see the last 10 or so years that um, active and passive seismic have remained relatively constant, 
but ambient noise has kind of boomed or exploded since about 2017. So it's overtaken active and passive seismic now in terms of how, many, how much it's mentioned in academic literature and in books. And there's been uh, a lot of development even since 2019, where this is the last data from. So the method has predominantly been used, like I said, in regional and crustal scale. So there's hundreds or thousands of studies showing how you can image the, the upper crust with ambient seismic waves. And, and some of these nice examples, the, the one from Nikolai Shapiro from 2004 shows the imaging of the San Andreas Fault. And on the left, the one from Chen et al. shows imaging of the low velocity zones beneath the Japanese volcanic hotspots. And how the method works is we, we listen, we record background noise. We record what's called ambient noise on receivers, which are indicated by these little houses at surface. And when we cross correlate those and we stack it, we, we, we retrieve the same signal as if we replaced one of the receivers with a source. So just for those, for, just to remind you, cross correlation is a measure of how similar two waveforms are as you shift one relative to the other. So you can see as we shift these waves relative to each other, we start seeing a signal emerge where exactly where the, where the, what the, seismic waves travel from one receiver to the other one. There's a, I'm not going to go into details about this, but just for completeness, there's a mathematical derivation about this too that relies on the stationary phase approximation. Um, so the, the basic concept is if you write out mathematically what this correlation looks like from a bunch of sources, then only the ones that are in line with the receivers contribute. For some higher level, level papers and some really nice introductory reading, the, these are two very nice articles that I recommend that you can look at that goes through the math mathematics and the, 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 the reasoning about why this works and also show some case studies. So the basic concept is if we have noise coming from all directions, so if we have, we have two receivers, A and B, and we have noise coming from all directions, that only the, the noise sources that are in these, these um, dashed lines, these stationary phase locations, only these ones contribute to the stack. So everything else destructively interferes and only the ones that are coming from in line of the sources constructively interfere. And you can see what's in, that's indicated by this figure in the middle and the figure on the right, which shows the stack. So I always find these figures kind of not very intuitive. So I thought I'd make, make some videos that show what, what the ambient noise wave field actually looks like. So what, does, what do we actually record when we put these stations out? And so the, the, the video that I'll show here is showing the, excuse me. The video that I'm showing here shows the, 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 the ambient noise recorded on, this, on one station on the bottom. And it shows what the wave field looks like then interpolated onto a mesh, so from all the stations. And then we see, excuse me. And then we'll see what the wave field looks like as, as the seismic waves propagate. So here we can see the, the noise looks quite chaotic. It looks a little bit trippy, in fact. So you can see that there are lots of scattered waves, waves coming from all directions. But if you look closely, you'll see there are some wave fronts that you can track. The, the signal on the bottom, bottom panel here shows an earthquake. This is an earthquake that happened in Fiji during this recording, about 4,000 kilometers away. And you'll see how different this, the, this wave field looks like when the earthquake traverses the array. So the earthquake here, here comes the earthquake coming across the array. And you can see the wave sweeping over the array. But pretty soon after the earthquake passes, you'll see that the, the waves look like they're very highly scattered again. This is one of the main observations that Aki made in, 19, in the 1950s is that the, these, these, the tail of earthquakes or the coda of earthquakes consist of very scattered waves, waves that scatter from geological discontinuities and come from all directions. And that, that really contains the same information that we have on noise. So if we then look at two, two stations in particular, so the top right and the bottom left station in this array, and if we record the, the noise, so here's two minutes of noise for both, both of these stations, and this is the correlation between these two, two traces, then we'll see as we add more data to this or more cross-correlate and stack more data, we'll see that a signal will start emerging in this correlation, which is the bottom, bottom figure. 
So you can see after six minutes, we see a, a, a small peak starting to appear. You can see in the bottom, in the top two panels that there are lots of different noise sources. Some of these are coming from um, Olympic Dam, which is about 50 kilometers to the southwest of the study area. Some of these are from cars and trucks driving over the road. But the important part is you'll see after about an hour, we see quite a strong signal that, that in this correlation function. And this, car, this signal here represents the, the, the same signal that we would get if one of these receivers was replaced by a source. So after a while, you'll see that this basically stabilizes and there's not much change in this, this virtual or in this, in this correlation function. And so if we do that between all pairs of stations, so not just one station pair, but all pairs of stations, then we can see what the, how the seismic waves propagate across the array. So in this animation, I've turned the, this, this receiver with the red star into a source. I've cross-correlated with all other station pairs to create this, this um, virtual active source signal. And then I'm gonna show what that looks like as that wave propagates through the array. So you can see here, we're playing over in time and you can see this wave front that traverses the array. You'll see something interesting through the middle. You can see for, for a while, you saw that there was a bit of a loss in coherence in the wave front, but, but it still traverses across the array. And I might just play that video once more. So again, at, at the start, you can see this wave front clearly em emanating from the source. You'll see that it slows down for a little bit during in the middle of this array, and then, then it becomes coherent again. So the, the magic here is that we we only listen to noise, we only listen to background vibrations, but by using this cross correlation and stacking, we've turned this receiver now into a source, and we can see how the seismic waves propagate through the array. In this case, the wavefront that we saw is quite low frequency, and it has a, a peak sensitivity at about a kilometer depth. And in this case, what we're seeing here is that the waves are sampling an alteration zone in the crystalline basement. So at about a kilometer, the basement here is about 800 meters deep. And at, in the middle of this area, there's an alteration zone where the seismic velocities are about 10% slower than the background. So you can see it even visually by eye how, how the waves are slowed down as it travels through this, through this zone. So we can, we can do that not just for one station, we can turn each of these stations into a source and each of the other stations into a receiver. And then we can track how the waves are moving across the array and build up a picture of what the subsurface looks like. The reason why we can do that is because these are what we're, what we're recovering are called surface waves. So in particular, rally waves in this case. And rally waves are really interesting in that they are um, dispersive. So, so different frequencies sample different depths. So at, at low frequencies, you can see here it says 0.5 hertz. And in this case, the waves sample down deeper than a kilometer depth. And say for about 0.7 hertz, it samples at about a kilometer depth. But the higher frequency waves sample much shallower. So at 5 hertz, we only sample about, say, 100 or 200 meter depth. So by, by looking at the, these, these surface waves at different frequencies, we can map out what the subsurface looks like at different depths. So what that process looks like, and this figure on the right here shows the sensitivity kernels of these waves at different frequencies for these surface waves. And again, showing that high frequency waves travel are trapped close to the surface. So they sample the really shallow subsurface and the low frequency waves sample deeper. So the process then to, to and how we kind of exploit this, this, this behavior is by, by looking at the, how the seismic wave speeds vary laterally by, again, by turning sensors into, uh, into sources. And we do that at different frequencies. And we know that the high frequency waves sample the shallow subsurface and the, and the, deep, and the low frequency waves sample deeper. So this is a this is a case of a nonlinear inverse problem where we measure velocity as a function of frequency and we invert by using these dispersion curves we invert to find the velocity as a function of depth. So the the basic principle is that we can turn we can use the background noise to turn receivers into sources. We can see how those source signals travel across the array and at what velocity they move from one sensor to the next. 
We can do those for different frequencies. And because different frequencies sample different depths, we can turn that into a 3D model of the subsurface. Just to kind of show, sorry, this is a very busy slide, but to show the entire process thing, if we go from the noise that we record in the top left, the first step we do is the cross correlating and stacking the noise to create these virtual source signals. Then we make pairwise measurements at different frequencies. And this is kind of visually illustrated here between by the lines here being colored by the apparent velocity between all station pairs. So we, we, we see the speed or the time that it takes for the waves to go from one station to the other and we convert that to a velocity. We then do a, a two dimensional inversion for each frequency. So we can get the lateral distribution of velocity at a given frequency. And then finally, we do the depth inversion, which is then going from velocity as a function of frequency to velocity as a function of depth. So that you can see there are two inverse problems that we tackle here. Uh, both are nonlinear inverse problems. So, so they, they do require prior information to, to effect, do effectively. Um, but the real power in this method is the, the fact that we can make measurements between pairs of stations. So even with only 100 stations, that means we have something like 5,000 station pairs we can, can, we can make measurements with. And because we can make measurements at different frequencies, we can see how the velocity varies with depth. Um, I can recommend that you, you look at a, a recent talk from uh, Baba Kairani from Geoscience Australia that, um, that goes into a little bit more detail into the technical difficulties and, that, and, and how we make measurements from these correlation functions. So um, I'll ask Jessica to put some of these links in the, in the description from the, in, when the chat goes on, when the, when the talk goes on YouTube, but you can go find this probably online as well. So I'm going to talk then very clear about some use cases of the method before I show a, a live demo of, the, of what this looks like. And I'm going to show some really kind of practical use cases um, or and case studies. So the first one here that I'll show is, is work that I'm, what we're doing with um, Graham, Graham Hainson and the team at the uh, University of Adelaide, which shows how you can combine ambient noise tomography um, and with magnetophilurics and natural field IP to get a to image or to explore under deep cover. So here, what the two figures we're seeing here are cross sections through the velocity model from, from A to A prime. So from in this north-south orientation and in this um, southwest-northeast orientation. And this is what the, the seismic velocities look like from a 3D model. So first you can see that the velocities are slower near surface and there's a transition from the, from the sedimentary cover to the crystalline basement. You can also see some indications of layering or stratigraphy in the, in the cover sequence. In this case, the quartzite being faster than the limestone and the shales. And then interestingly, you can also identify some low velocity zones in the crystalline basement. And this is what I was referring to before in this operation zone where the seismic waves could visibly even slow down. Where we could see that. So once we do this depth inversion and, and see what the distribution of the velocities are as a function of depth, we can map out some of these things like the alteration zone in the, in the crystalline basement. Another very practical use case um, for the method is, so this is a kind of a nice case study to show how you can combine this method with other geophysics. So this, this, this paper has just been submitted or will, will now be submitted and um, I'll Please keep an eye on the fleet website or LinkedIn to, to when, when this becomes available online. Another very practical use case that, uh, that we face, especially with imaging at depth, is to do cover corrections for potential field measurement, measurements. So this image here on the top right just shows a very simple illustration of a economic copper deposit that is in, in the cover sequence, but there's quite uh, quite large variations in the crystalline basement. So the bottom left shows the, the kind of basement variations here on a 10 by 10 kilometer scale. And this, this slice here shows a slice through y equals zero. And, and this is the kind of where the ore deposit sits. And you can see if you don't do any cover corrections, then the, the gravity or the gravity anomaly response doesn't show anything in the vicinity of where the ore deposit is. And even if you remove this with a, this with a with, or high-pass filter or remove it by a long period trend, we still can't see this 
is the ore deposit. And that's simply because the variations in the basement topography are quite large and can, can basically hide any indications of denser bodies. If you then, if you can recover the basement surface and even you don't even have to recover it very accurately, if you can recover it with say plus minus 10% accuracy, then you can remove the, the contributions of the cover from the gravity or even from the undulations in the basement topography will from the gravity. And what you get then is a very clear gravity response associated with this deposit. So this is a numerical case study, but this is something that we encounter frequently is people want to clean up their potential field data. They want to remove some effects of, of, um, of cover or cover basement contacts and, and try and get the most out of their potential field data. And again, this is especially um, important for, for exploring at depth or undercover. The figure on the bottom, bottom top right shows an image from uh, Alareza Malemer's paper from 2011 that shows that seismic velocities and densities are typically uh, related except for sulfides. But what this basically indicates too is that if you have some petrophysical data or if you have a good empirical relationship between velocity and density, you can also combine ambient noise tomography and density directly in a joint inversion. So that does rely on having a good petrophysics relationship, but there are even um, publicly available empirical relationships that one can use as the first pass to try and reveal areas where the velocity and densities are not well linked. So like, for instance, these sulfides. Another very practical use case that we see often is what I would kind of call, say, geophysical interpolation. So this is a case where you have um, you have some drilling information available, but you want to see what the different rocks do in between drill holes. And I think we've all heard stories about um, surprises that we get between drill holes and how so something like how much the the depth of cover might vary over kind of relatively short distances. And so using a method like this, which is a three D imaging method, it's a very effective way to glue all your other data together. So you can think about it like geophysical interpolation, or you can think about it as a way how you can use a very scalable 3D imaging method to glue together or interpret your drilling very effectively. Another use case that, that's kind of come to light recently is the, the, the use of geophysics with uh, drilling and machine learning. So the, the real benefit about ambient noise tomography is that it's a very scalable and very easy to use 3D imaging method. And so that opens up a lot of opportunities in machine learning for exploration. So we can do these surveys very quickly and very um, effectively and create get 3D models of the subsurface. And that's a very, very um, interesting enabling technology for doing machine learning and, and, and combining ambient noise tomography and other geophysics and drilling to, to try and predict what drilling success would be in future areas. This is some work we're doing with our friends at Bella Vista Resources. This is a research and development project, but you can go check out this case study that will be available on our website as well. Okay, I'm gonna quickly then run into a live demo. So as I mentioned before, we're doing a survey at the moment. So our crew is out in the field at the moment deploying this at an IOCG deposit. So you can see the, the light gray stations indicate the planned locations and the, 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 the visible stations here indicate the ones we've deployed. And you can see we started deploying this yesterday at about um, 9 a.m. in the morning. It's in GMT time here, but about 9 a.m. in the morning. And we can see monitor the battery status and uh, what the signal to noise ratios of the average correlation functions are so far. So you can see we're almost done with this array and we can take a look at what the results look like so far. So uh, just a disclaimer, these are very preliminary results. These inversion results have not been constrained either. So these are what we call blind inversion results. But nevertheless, we can already see some really interesting features. So this now shows the 3D model that's been constructed. So you can see this one was constructed about an hour ago at 10.34. Um, so, and what we see here is what the seismic velocities look like as a function of depth. So I'll slide through some of these to show some of the interesting features we observe. And I'll adjust the color scale to remove some of these others. 
So some of the interesting things here, this is an ISG deposit where uh, we have very thin cover. Um, so we only have about between 10 and 50 meters of cover. Um, and then we have these sub-vertical um, mineralized bodies that are, are uh, associated with iron oxide. So they're typically faster. And you can see how, how well we can image some of these potential sub-vertical bodies. There's another nice example. So this is a, section, a slice through this model. And the other interesting part is if we look at, say, 300 meter depth, we can also see the trend of these, so the, the lateral trend. And again, these, these high velocities are the, or these red colors are the faster velocities. So you can beautifully see the trend of some of these, the, presumably these are mineralized bodies. And even if we go deeper, we can see uh, the gabbroic intrusions that are, are visible here. So these faster bodies at depth are presumably the gabbroic intrusions that, that, that are um, in, this, in this area. So you can see the kind of ability of the method to construct models very quickly. This, these sensors have only been out in the field for, for less than a day or for just about a day now right now. And the deployment's not even finished yet, but we can create these 3D models of the subsurface very effectively. Uh, we're big believers in, in conducting this method in real time. And, and there are obvious benefits to us for that. The first is when we start getting 3D models, we can adjust the array to to best exploit the noise conditions, first of all. And secondly, also to change resolution into areas that, we, that are perspective. Yeah, so the reason why we are firm believers in conducting this method in a, a real-time fashion and, and imaging the subsurface in real time is because it gives us the opportunity to, to assess the noise conditions in real time. So I mentioned before that in order for us to be able to use this method, we need noise to be coming from all directions. But if we have noise that's coming from a particular direction, we can still adjust the array to, to take to, to exploit the noise conditions. It also gives us the opportunity to, to dynamic to do dynamic imaging of a target. And the analogy here from a medical um, medical imaging industry is if you've been if you've had an ultrasound before, you would have noticed how much the ultrasound technician moves the wand around to get a better view of the target. So we think about the real-time geophysics in the same way, that we can adjust the array dynamically to get a better view of what the subsurface looks like. And then finally, of course, we think it's very valuable that you can do rapid infilling so, or ra rapid adjustment of the array. So I think we've all probably been involved in geophysical surveys where we see something very interesting at the edge of the array, and we wish we moved the array slightly to one direction. Or we see some an area that's very perspective, looks very perspective or interesting, and we wish we had more stations there. So another way to put this is we can start these surveys with relatively wide spacing and get like a good view, a good rough view of the subsurface, but then adjust resolution effectively so you don't waste resolution and time and cost on areas that are barren. So just as in conclusion then about, about the method. So it's a new seismic method that's really effective in bridging the gap between something like HVSR and 3D active survey. It's very cost effective and it's very low impact uh, and very easy to do. So we call it a very scalable 3D imaging method. And it's something that we, we haven't had in the mining industry yet. It can, we can integrate other data sets, of course, as well. The obvious one is gravity because of the link between velocities and densities, uh, but we can also use um, more advanced clustering algorithms or machine learning to create, um, to, to, to generate targets or to train on drilling to generate targets. It's scalable in a, in, in a sense that we can do a lot of surveys fast and cover ground really fast. And we can piece together data from with different resolutions. So we can interpolate between drill holes, or we can effectively um, try and identify at which depth a potential field anomaly is occurring. But on the other hand, it's not a silver bullet. So two of the kind of weaknesses that we've seen, or some of the difficulties that we encounter, is that seismic velocities can be hard to interpret. So so the link between or many geologists or geophysicists don't have a very good handle on what seismic velocities mean. They also don't have a very good idea of what the seismic velocity of say granite versus sandstone is. So, but that's kind of work in progress. We're building up a lot of case studies at the moment and we're trying to create a bit of a library around these physical properties. 
The second problem, which again is not unique to, to ambient noise tomography, but we still have a geophysical or uh, inverse problem to solve. So we actually have two inverse problems to solve typically. So, and both are non-unique. So there's inherent uncertainty in the data. And this is what constraining data is so important. We have to give the, help the model get closer to the true solution. So we have to, if we have information about the subsurface, um, if we have an idea, a geological model of the subsurface in mind, then we can add all of that as, const as constraints into the inverse problem to get us closer to what, what the true solution is. Yeah, I think that's all I had to say, Jessica. Uh, thanks a lot for, your, for everyone's attention, and I look forward to getting some questions from the audience. Thank you so much. That was, yeah, super cool. So thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, there are heaps of questions coming through the chat, so I'll start with a few of them. Um, how many days will the array be in place for the demo area and cost per day for surveys similar to that of that demo? Yes, so for this demo area, it's, it's quite a unique case because we are, this is like a research and development project we're doing effectively. So we'll leave the array in place for two, two weeks in this case. But that being said, the quality of the data after one day already indicates that if this was a production survey, you'd probably only leave it in place for two days before you'd move it on or adjust the array. So we kind of, we monitor two things. We monitor the signal to noise ratio of the correlation functions to see like, are the signals strong enough to extract information? And secondly, we also look at the stability of the 3D models, like how much do they change from one time to the next? So if we have a high signal to noise ratio and the model is quite stable, then we would be happy to move the stations or adjust the array to get a better view of the target. In terms of the cost per day, so the cost per survey is probably a better metric or cost per month, but it's without getting saying too much, it's probably about 20 times less than an active survey for the same dimensions. And it's probably on par with an MT or EM survey, roughly speaking. So, uh, yeah, so I guess if you if you want more details and we can, we can talk about that later. Yeah, awesome. Um, lots coming through. What is the sample site location tolerance? So it's dependent on the, the array spacing. So you can imagine if you're doing a very high resolution, small scale survey, then you need to have know the locations of the stations very accurately. So you need to know it within sub-meter accuracy. But for the survey, like the one I showed for where the stations were separated by 300 meters, plus minus five meters would be a relative, would be a fine tolerance. So something like 1% tolerance relative to the interstation spacing would have a negligible effect on your results because we can't resolve 1% changes in velocity anyway. So it scales linearly like that in that sense. Yeah. Um... Besides the satellite aspect, how does this technology compare to that offered by SysProbe? Yeah, it's very similar. So SysProbe is a company in France that does ambient noise tomography using the kind of offline approach. So they, they put instruments in the field and they, they harvest the data and process the data afterwards. The methodolo methodologically, we're doing very similar, really a very similar process. The main difference is the real time versus not. And that has other consequences. The first is it's not just about how quickly you get your results. It's, about, it's also about exploiting the noise conditions effectively. So we have to have like a, a really early view of where the noise is coming from and how strong it is to be effectively carry out these surveys. So SysProb often do a, a noise test where they send a, a small subarray to an area first to test the conditions and then use that to plan a later survey. But for us, that's kind of a natural part of the of the first few hours of the survey process is to assess the conditions and then move on. What spacing of stations is optimal or how do you determine station spacing? Yeah, so the station spacing, especially at shallow depths, the space, station spacing has a big influence on the resolution. So the closer the station spacing, the higher the resolution, especially the, the lateral resolution, if you will. But the, because we're using surface waves, the resolution does decrease with depth. So as kind of as a simple rule of thumb, for the, for the, say for the top 500 meters or so, the station spacing is quite important. And you'd probably want to have something like maybe 200 meter spacing between your, between your devices to get kind of get the best type of resolution you want. 
but as you go deeper, the, the wave physics becomes more important than the array geometry. So another kind of example is for the Oz array, so the Geoscience Australia array that's being laid out um, at the moment, they're using 40 kilometer spacing between stations because they're trying to identify the, the kind of lith lithospheric structure of the or, or the changes in the depth of the lithosphere in, in Western Australia. So the, the station, station spacing is very relevant to what you're trying to image. So for very small sub-vertical bodies, you would want to have quite tight spacing, but if you're looking for a large um, automatic intrusion, then you can probably get away with a larger spacing. Is there a difference in capacity of the pairs in a grid? Example, the pairs on the outside of a grid um, versus pairs in the middle? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so this is a basic concept. If you have station pairs that are that are separated by, say, kilometer depth or by kilometer spacing, then we can sample waves of approximately that same wavelength. So. We can look at wavelengths that are about a kilometer long, and that means we can image down to say about 300 meter depth, but a little bit more, but just as a kind of a rough rule of thumb. So that immediately shows you that the longer station pairs are important for imaging deep, and the closer station pairs are important for imaging shallow. So, so for instance, if you are mostly interested in, in, in deep stuff and you're not too interested in, in what's shallow, then it makes sense to have your array denser around the edges and less dense near the middle because you have more of those long station pairs or more pairs that have long offsets you can, can use. So yeah, absolutely. So the so the close the close station pairs are useful for high frequencies and shallow imaging. The long station pairs are useful for low frequencies and, and deeper imaging. Awesome. So many questions coming through. This is fun. Um, with a limited exploration budget, why would you use A and T compared to? I'm going to butcher this. He lied to IP. Heli team or IP? I guess. Yeah. So Heli team. Yeah, that one. It, it it just depends on what you're exploring for and what depths you're exploring for. So so with with Heli team and IP, both are really effective methods. They are Heli team is depth limited, so maybe two or 300 meter depth is kind of the limit you can achieve. It also depends on the characteristics of the rocks. So is con conductivity a good measure or is velocity a good measure? And similarly with IP too, it's, you know, we do see a lot of, or some 3D IP surveys now, but in a lot of ways it's done in a 2D sense. So the, the, the main benefit of ANT is imaging deep and quite high resolution um, and relatively low cost. And again, the field work is really easy as well. So it's kind of one of the just easiest geophysical methods to apply nowadays. But then again, it, it depends on very much on what you're exploring for. So some of those other methods might be more suitable for certain for the deposit types or, or deposit styles. But as a versatile imaging method that can image deep with high resolution, there's very few that can come, or there's nothing I think that can come close to ANT. Um, does the mythology lend itself to both P and S waves? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so we, what we record on these arrays are surface waves. So for single component sensors, we measure rally waves and for, for three component sensors, we measure love waves. Both of those are mostly sensitive to the S waves of the shadow crust. So it is, uh, uh, some dependence on P wave velocity and some dependence on density for rally waves. But predominantly, what we're measuring is, is S waves. So that's why you'll see the, the models that we, we present and the case studies all have a, a S wave velocity model. That being said, there's quite a lot of there's quite a lot of um, literature and relating P wave velocity and S wave velocity and, and density. So one can to some extent convert from one to the other one. It's not it's not perfect, but you can to some extent. Awesome. Um, could you integrate legacy active seismic into these surveys and data? Yeah, it's, um, it's a really something that we see often. So we see a lot of like, for instance, Geoscience Australia doing regional 2D active seismic lines. And again, a very effective use of this method is if you see a reflector or a fault in your 2D active seismic survey, is to do a, a large a A and T survey over the top of that, and then basically extrapolate. Between where you're seeing something like a fault or a basement contact, 
and and kind of either extrapolate between 2D seismic or interpolate between 2D active site seismic lines or extrapolate from a, a single 2D line to see see how you can add the interpretation. So it's another form of I would say geophysical interpretation uh, interpolation. So you can do you know between drill holes, between active seismic lines, between IP lines even. So it's a very effective way to to glue all your measurements together. Um Heaps coming through still. Uh, okay. Thanks, Jarrett. Can you comment on if there are signal losses or challenges, if there is a velocity inversion in the cover or significant changes in velocity between units? Yeah. And what about the anisotropic nature of the natural noise source, i.e. the coast? Can that affect the ability to model bodies in different orientations? Yes. So the first one is about signal loss through, say, um, Consolidated material. So, say for instance, if we have sand cover, for instance, so sand cover or, or like unconsolidated cover often acts like a bit of a, a low pass filter. So, you lose quite a bit of high frequency information. The high frequencies get attenuated through, through that kind of cover. The low frequencies are mostly sensitive to deeper structures, so they can pass through that kind of relatively unencumbered. So for something like um, in Chile, where we have a lot of like sand cover, then it's then, then it can be quite effective, especially if you're looking for say a porphyry, a deep porphyry copper deposit. In that case, it won't be that affected. But if you're interested in a very very shallow study where you have unconsolidated cover, then attenuation can be an issue. So that's uh, definitely something to, to to bear in mind for for shallow studies. For deeper studies where we use low frequencies. It's not really an issue because the low frequencies take very long to attenuate. Any other uh, other question? Oh, the, yeah. an, the anisotropic nature of the noise. <clears throat> yeah, so this is actually one of the main reasons why almost all the studies you've seen will see in academia are on crustal and and regional scales, and that's because there are these waves are kind kind of kind of coming from everywhere. Because it doesn't matter where you look, there's an ocean in some direction. At, um, and because these waves take very long to attenuate. But at higher frequencies, the noise is very often anisotropic. So it's often coming from one direction. So in the example I showed before, like I mentioned, Olympic Dam was 40 kilometers to the southwest and it was by far the strongest source. So in that case, there are a couple of things you need to do. So you need to make sure that you only use station pairs that are favorably orientated to the noise. So you don't want um, station pairs where the noise is coming from from the from the orthogonal direction, and you only want to use pairs that are aligned. But an even better consideration then is to adjust the array so that most of your station pairs are pointing towards where the noise is coming from. So you can think about having a, a rectangular array with a long axis pointing towards where the noise is coming from, as opposed to a, a square array. So that's kind of what again one of the benefits of doing this in real time is you can see where the noise is coming from and what the relative strengths of the noise sources are, and you can adjust the array accordingly to to exploit that. Awesome. Um, what types of deposits are an ideal target for ANT? Yeah, so it's kind of difficult to say because it depends very much on the host rock and the, the type of deposit and the conditions, but in general. You can you can image relatively small deposits if there's a high velocity contrast between that and the host. So for some so for some deposit types, like uh, you probably have seen, we've had some success with lithium pegmatites, for instance. So, but that's quite challenging because we we rely on that velocity contrast. And the other sense, other and the other sense, if we have quite a large intrusive body, so like a porphyry intrusion. There doesn't need to be a big velocity contrast because the wave sample that like large body quite for a long time. So from my perspective, the best use cases of the method are things like um, all free copper deposits, IOCGs, and any of these kind of, kind of large intrusive bodies that that are potentially quite deep and economical. So so from my perspective, that's useful. That being said, there are lots of there are lots of interesting use cases where where direct detection is not necessarily the main goal. So there's lots of things to consider. Awesome. Um, great talk. Can you comment on how signal strength might vary around a continent or the globe? Would you recommend a signal test in some cases? 
Yeah, so the low frequencies, like like the previous question suggested, low frequencies closer to the coast typically are stronger <clears throat> because of the interaction of the, of the ocean swell with the coast. The proximity to an urban center or like a highway, that's very important. And mines themselves are very strong in lower sources as well. <clears throat> so mines have lots of activities like crushers, mill, uh, even an open pit kind of it's continuously ringing effectively so mines are actually an active operating mines are really strong noise sources so we it's really important that you use the right instruments and instruments that are really sensitive so that you increase your chances of recording favorable noise the areas where we're kind of at risk of not recording noise is if you're trying to do a shallow high resolution study in a remote area because then again you you're relying on high frequencies High frequencies are only generated by really human activity. So that's kind of one of the kind of, <clears throat> let's say the areas where a noise test or assessment is really important. And again, using as sensitive instruments as you can. But in general, for the deeper and larger scale imaging projects, we rely on low frequencies. The low frequency waves travel very far. So we can, we're not really too concerned about noise conditions if you're trying to image you know, a two, three, four, 500 meter depth or down to two kilometer depth. Awesome. Um, is the data 3D inverted or are a collection of 1D inversions stitched together to generate the 3D cube? You can do you can do both. So the the workflow that I showed before, which is kind of the most common way of doing it, it's done in a two-step way. So first is to to regionalize the velocity as a function of frequency into 2D, and then to do a 1D inversion that you stitch together in a 3D model, which is what the question refers to. But you can also do a direct 3D inversion, which is where you have, you directly invert your measurements between station pairs to 3D. So like with any 3D inversion, it is, the constraints are very important. So if your constraints are wrong, then, then you won't get a really good solution to that inverse problem. And it, it's probably a good idea to try both, to try and do the, the two-step, the 2D and then 1D approach and, or, or, and, try to do the direct 3D approach. Thank you so, so much, Jarrett, for getting involved today. It was awesome to get you on. So yeah, really appreciate your time. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks, everyone.